so let's continue our lecture on isotopes so let's talk about atomic mass how do you calculate the atomic mass of a given substance so in general we calculate by two measures the common measure that is used in the SI system the common measure that you use in the SI system is the concept of kilogram or gram but in chemistry we use a unit called U or AMU so AMU represents atomic mass unit So atomic mass unit the standard comes from the relative scale where we consider that a carbon atom so especially carbon 12 atom weighs 12 units so we we assume that the carbon 12 atom weighs 12 units so if you take the actual mass of the carbon atom so if you take the actual mass then in one u is given by the value of 1.66054 into 10 to the power negative 24 grams this is the equivalent in equivalent conversion scale for one unit or one atomic mass unit so a hydrogen atom would weigh 1.008 amu right so then these values are generally written on a scale but this, this brings up the question how come uh, how do you find the isotopic mass or how do you know that there are isotopes that can exist so one way of doing this is by a method called mass spectrometry So what do we do in mass spectrometry? For example, let's say I have an atom of neon. Let's say I have an isotope neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. So to find that how much of, so in general when you take an element, all of the element is not one isotope, one of the isotopes. So you don't get one isotope. You get a mixture of all isotopes so to find how much of the mixture is a particular isotope we use mass spectrometry to do that so what do we do in mass spectrometry is we hit the neon gas with a powerful source of high energy electrons when hit with a powerful source of high energy electrons one of the electrons gets knocked out causing it to become positively charged so it causes the ion to become positively charged so what do we do next is we pass that ions the positively charged ions through a electro electronic beam through an electric field and a magnetic field so if you remember from the behavior the so we know that charged particles so bend in magnetic field so before we do here so let me give you a simple example of this so what we do here is first you pass it through an electric field so this is the electric field where you have a negative plate on the top and the positive plate on the bottom next you have a magnetic field the magnetic field is where you have north on one side and then south on the other side So what happens now is when the gas comes through the, for example, let's take it as a single ray of atoms. So a single ray of these atoms. When it comes near the electrical field, notice the ions are, so 20 neon, 21 neon, and 22 neon. Notice the number of protons. So the higher the number of protons, the more they are attracted towards the negative plate. So what happens here? When the ray comes closer and closer to the electric field, it splits it into three parts. So it splits it into three parts. 
and each one of them so the one the closest one is the largest one this becomes 21 neon and the last one becomes the one with the least number of protons so these as they go along in the string in the way they as they go along the structure because the magnetic field bends them so they bend much more higher and they end up hitting the screen somewhere here so here the deviation of the neon particles is proportional to their mass content is generally proportional to their mass content so what happens here so the more the ones that they are uh, the ones that are bending more so will hit the will hit the target at the least and the ones that are there will hit the target at the end so causing it to form so this kind of lines on a graph so these are what we call the abundance percentage so this is what it will look like when you take it on that uh, detector so once you figured figured out that the detector uh, you know results gives a particular result so once we figure that the detector gives a particular result so the abundance of the particles the number of particles that are hitting at a particular particular part can be calculated as a percentage so that percentage is 20 neon is about 95 90.5 percent 21 neon is 0.3 percent and 22 neon is 9.2 percent which means an atom of neon does not have one single isotope so it has multiple isotopes so if it has multiple isotopes how do you calculate the actual mass of the or the atomic mass of neon so how to calculate the atomic mass of neon so what we do here is we take the weighted average of all the masses of isotopes that's end, that ends up being the mass of neon. So rather than choosing one single atom to have a spe specific amount of mass, we choose the weighted average and that weighted average is what you see in the periodic table. So that is the weighted average that we generally see uh, floating around as atomic mass. So let's take an example and let's see if we can calculate the atomic mass for a given unit. So I have silver here. Z47 has two naturally occurring isotopes, so 107 Ag and 109 Ag. So from that data, from the mass spectrometry data, so they are they are asking you to calculate the atomic mass of silver. So this is the data they have given. So how do you calculate the weighted average? So the weighted average of the mass is the percentage times the mass, mass 1, so the percentage 1 times mass 1 plus the percentage 2 times mass 2. So here you have two different elements. So let us consider the abundance percentage. So what we do here is we take the percentage value. I will multiply it with mass and percentage value again add it up and then percentage value into mass. So here the percentage, the first mass is 107 Ag. So 51 point, so we write 51.84 times 106.90509 plus, so this is the first one. The second one is 48.16 times 108.90476 divided by 100. So once we have that, notice that there are four significant figures at least that we will have to write down. So just let us try and write down the, notice that this is a plus mark, plus, ma plus matter there. So what do we do there? Once we get this sum, so the first one is 50, 5.42. Plus 52.45. So let me write down the total answer. The total answer will be 107.87 AMU. So this is the mass of silver.
silver. So this is the atomic mass of silver. Not the atomic mass of individual isotopes, but the average or the weighted average of the atomic mass of silver. So this is how we can calculate the atomic mass of silver. So remember the formula for weighted average. Weighted average is percentage into the mass plus percentage into the mass divided by 100. So this is the formula for weighted average. So this is how we can calculate the mass of a any given quantity depending on the individual isotopes mass. So this brings up the question, what do we do with these masses? So the initial idea was to make sure that we calculate all of them and we make it into a big group of elements. So from then, from the initial stages of chemistry, people always wanted to classify elements in a certain manner. The one that who succeeded was Mendeleev. So Mendeleev's uh, periodic table was the first understanding of how to arrange atoms and the principle is still used and uh, this is the modern periodic table that we use nowadays and uh, notice the what are the different characteristics and notice the different colors. So the upper part are the elements that we generally see in nature, the down part are elements that are rare in nature, so these are rare, rare metals. So let's take other example, let's see the periodic table in itself. Everything that you see in this blue, so from here, so all of these come under the class of metals. So all of these generally come under the class of metals. Right? So there are different types of metals again, but these are all the class of metals. Everything in yellow everything that you see here in yellow, including hydrogen, these are all non metals. And the ones that are stuck between metals and metal uh, non metals are called metalloids. So where they have some characteristics of metals, some characteristics of non-metals. And everything that you would see in the down part, all of these here also come under the classification of metals. Now there are three types of metals, structures that you will generally see, transition metals and inner transition metals and main group metals. So an example of uh, a main group metal, main group metals are elements, uh, you know, main group metals are generally the ones that you see in the forward part of the periodic table and this part. So these are main group metals. And the ones in the center, these pieces are called transition metals. So these, the down part are called inner transition metals. So all of these material metals are called inner transition metals and obviously these are non-metals and the ones that are stuck in the between them are not metalloids. So these are examples of metalloids. Most common metalloids are silicon and uh, germanium. So those two are commonly used as uh, materials that are commonly used for uh, making semiconductors. So one peculiar characteristic why they are metalloids is because they are not good as a conductor as that of metals but they are not insulators like non-metals. So they are in somewhere in between, that's why most commonly they are used as semiconductors. So this is the idea behind the topics of metals, metalloids and non-metals. Next. So we discussed the common concepts now, let's go into the concept of bonding. So we discussed what are compounds. So compounds are materials with different characteristics individually but collectively they and they act as a single unit. So most compounds are generally classified into two types. Either they can be ionic compounds or covalent compounds. So let's talk about an ionic compound. So what happens in an ionic compound? So most common ionic compound is NaCl, sodium chloride, which is also called as your table salt. 
So sodium is a soft metal and chlorine is a gas. So sodium has a solidic structure, chlorine is a gaseous structure which is separated in the form of Cl2 molecules and sodium exists as a metal in a metallic uh, matrix. When both of them combine what happens here is sodium has excess protons in comparison to its electrons. So this, uh, this uh, you know, imbalance what it, do, what it does is it's always ready to donate its electron. Notice that uh, atoms have a characteristics to become stable. That stability causes it to behave oddly. Notice sodium is the right metal right after so sodium is the metal right after neon. So remember that this this series of last 8A group elements are called inert gases. So inert gases are generally stable gases. They are always generally uh, they do not react with anything. So to reach that stability sodium always donates its electrons. So it's always ready to donate its electrons. So chlorine is an atom that always likes to accept electrons. So this loses electrons, the other gains electrons. And both of them combine and form a matrix structure and that is how what or a crystalline structure. So this type of bonding is called as an ionic bond. So how does the ionic bond come through here? So ionic bond refers to where there is a transfer of electrons between the bonded atoms. Here sodium and chlorine. Sodium is donating an electron to chlorine. So what happens now? It creates Na plus and Cl minus and both of them combine together to form NaCl. This is an example of an ionic bond inside a structure. Now ionic bonds the name itself says is that the bonds between ions. So these are bonds that generally always form between ions. So how the what is the characteristics of these ionic bonds? So ionic bonds are use the same characteristics as that of the Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law states that the force acting force between two charges or the energy between two charges is proportional to the product of the charges. So charge 1 times charge 2 over distance. So which means the higher the charge, the higher the energy. The lower the distance, the higher the energy. So this is what creates the stronger bonds when you take up uh, ionic compounds because their energy is electrostatic forces. So the ele electrostatic energy is much more stronger than other energies. So what happens here is when you have similar charges, attraction will increase as the charge will increase. right? But when you start noticing that as the atomic size, the attraction size decreases, so attraction increases when the size decreases. So whenever you have a charge decreases, so when for example 2 to be 2 becomes 1, there is a decrease in the attraction. But when the atom becomes smaller and smaller, so the smaller the atom, the higher the attraction. So and the same thing with the higher the charge, the higher the attraction. The smaller the atom, the smaller, the higher the attraction. So what are the relationship between these ions that form near to the noble gas? So any element wants to attain a noble gas configuration. So meaning that they want to have the same number of electrons as that of noble gases because noble gases themselves are stable. So that is the reason why hydrogen always tries to accept an electron to become nearly equal to that of helium. Lithium always loses an electron to get a configuration that is similar to helium, have a number of electrons similar to helium. The same thing with magnesium, magnesium 2 loses 2 electrons to have the same number of electrons as that of neon. This is the relationship that causes the formation of ions. So the elements before the noble gas, so the elements before the noble gas always attain a 
a negative charge. So, but the elements after the noble gas always attain a positive charge. So, they are always trying to attain a positive charge. So, that is the difference between the that is the relationship between the ions that form and the nearest noble gas. Now, if the noble gas, if the element is right next after the noble, noble gases, they lose one electron, so they get a plus one charge. So, all 1A group elements generally get a plus one charge. All 2A group elements always generally get a plus two charge. And all 7A group elements generally end up getting a negative one charge. And all 6A group elements generally get a negative two. And all 5A elements negative three. The same thing with 3A elements plus three. So, plus, plus two, plus one. So, when you lose an electron, you get a positive charge. When you gain an electron, you get a negative charge. So, remember the difference between plus and minus. So, plus refers to that it loses, it, it has lost an electron. Minus refers to the concept that it is gaining an electron. Now, so let us try what is the ions that form. So, predict the monoatomic ion formed by each of the following elements. So, let us try and solve the problem. Here, we are talking first about iodine. So, we the first thing we want to know is which is the closest ideal gas so or the inert gas to this element. So, the closest gas to this element or the closest element near that or the closest inert element to near that is going to be xenon. So, xenon which has an atomic number of 54. So, xenon has an atomic number of 54. So, notice that iodine it wants to attain a 54 charge. So, which means that it needs one more electron. So, iodine tries to gain electrons because it wants to reach the xenon configuration. So, generally it becomes I minus. So, and how many electrons does it need is the number of minus charges. So, it needs one electron. So, we write one minus charge. Next is calcium. So, for calcium the most the nearest noble gas is argon which is 18. Now, remember that if the argon if the gas has greater than the number of electrons if the inert gas has greater than the number of electrons that the element has it gains a negative charge. If it is less than the one, it gets a positive charge. So, calcium loses two electrons. So, which means that it becomes calcium 2 plus. Aluminum again. So, aluminum is at equal to 13. But the closest inert gas is neon which is at equal to 10. So, it has to lose three electrons. So, we can write AL 3 plus. So, the number refers to the number it gains or loses and plus refer, refers to that it is losing it and minus refers to the fact that it is gaining it. So, this is the idea behind the topic of how the charges are generally formed. Next, let us talk about a covalent compound. So, we talked about an ionic compound, let us talk about a covalent compound. Covalent compounds are formed by a covalent bond. So, what is a covalent bond? So, covalent bond is not transfer but rather sharing. So, for example, let us take chlorine atoms. So, each chlorine atom has 17 electrons. So, this chlorine needs one electron. for stability and this chlorine also needs one electron for stability. So, what do these two think is that you know why not share the electrons that we have so that you also gain and I also gain. So, what they do is this donates one electron, this donates one electron and they both share those electrons. So, when they share those electrons, both of them form a bond. So, this type of bond is called as a covalent bond. 
how does this work so let's take the simplest example which is two hydrogens so hydrogen has one proton each right so which means that then you have one proton and one electron each. so this needs one electron and this needs one electron to gain helium configuration so what will they do here if you imagine a hydrogen atom hydrogen atom has one proton at the center and one electron on the outer edge So you have two electrons. So there is a positive charge in the center, and there is two electrons on the outer edge. So this is the electron that we have, the negative charged electron. So as the elements come closer and closer together, so there are two things that we have to remember. Positives, so plus and plus, so like charges, repel each other and unlike charges attract each other. So between this positive and this negative charge, there is an attraction force, the same thing with this negative and this positive charge it has an attraction force but there is a repulsion force between negative and negative and positive and positive right so here the red represents repulsion and the black part represents attraction right so these molecules are trying to repel each other and these molecules are trying to attract each other. Now, if the attraction of between the like charges, sorry, between the unlike charges becomes equal to the repulsion between the like charges, this at this position it reach, reaches an equilibrium, and that position is what we call a covalent bond so it creates a position for a covalent bond so this is how a covalent bond generally forms so i hope you understand the concept of a covalent bond so this is how a covalent compound also forms so all of the molecules that are covalently bonded will come closer together and they end up forming a bond so this is the example of a covalent bond So what are molecules and ions? So the basic unit of an element or a covalent compound consists of two or more atoms that are bonded by sharing of electrons. So most of these covalent substances consist of molecules and ions. Ions is a, ion is a single atom or a covalently bonded group of atoms that have an overall electric charge. So there are no molecules in an ionic compound. So ionic compound comprises of ions, covalent compound consists of molecules. This is the, the only difference between or the main difference between covalent compounds and ionic compounds. So one distinguishable difference between them is ionic compounds contain charges and covalent compound contains molecules. Right now, so what are the elements that occur as molecules? Most common elements are non-metals most commonly hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine and selenium and sulfur are some metals, there are other elements as well. These are what we call octatomic molecules and phosphorus. Phosphorus is a tetraatomic molecule. So tetraatomic refers to four atoms combining four uh, atoms combining to form a molecule. Octoatomic molecule meaning that eight atoms combine to form a single molecule. So this is an example of an example of an ion that has a covalent bond. So these are what we call polyatomic ions. So polyatomic ions consist of two or more atoms that are covalently bonded, but in their combination will end up having a charge so in many reactions these are the ones that remain together as a single unit even though they be so even though they are made up of you know covalent bonds they act as a single unit and they act have a charge so this is how they end up forming 
So this is an example of the carbonate ion CO32 minus in calcium carbonate.